myself. Um, okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to this event, part of the Writing Technologies Torch Network, a discussion of Paola Bertucci's 2017 book, Artisanal Enlightenment, Science and the Mechanical Arts in Old Regime France. My name is Jenny Oliver. I'm a departmental lecturer in the Faculty of Medieval and Modern Languages at Oxford and at Worcester College, and I'm a specialist in early modern, mostly 16th century French literatures and cultures. For those who may be new to writing technologies events, this is a network that fosters conversations between specialists across and sometimes beyond the early modern period. Through interdisciplinary cross readings of literary works and texts on techniques and inventions, we examine the mutual impact of scientific, technical and literary writings in early modern culture. So we explore, for example, literary and scientific forms of crafting and experimentation, the various editorial strategies deployed by the inventor as an author and the author as an inventor, and the role of the imagination and of literary artistic technologies, such as analogical figures, metaphors, sketches and drawings in scientific invention. And you can find out more about all this in the network and sign up for email updates if you'd like through our pages on the Torch website. We're immensely grateful for the support of Torch and today in particular to the Torch Network's team, Sarah Berb and Nikki Carter for their fantastic work behind the scenes, clicking the right buttons and making all this happen. And we must also thank the Maison Française d'Oxford, where the first meetings of this network in its earlier form and in the flesh rather than on screen took place from 2018 and they continue to support our activities in myriad ways. Today, as I've said, we're here to discuss artisanal enlightenment and we'll be hearing from Paula, who we're so excited to have with us for about 20 minutes before a number of discussants from our team and our guests will have questions for Paula. So to present these discussants very briefly, we have Victoria von Hoffmann, a research associate for the Belgian Fund for Scientific Research affiliated to the University of Liège, a specialist in the social and cultural history of the lower senses that is taste and touch in early modern Europe. She's currently engaged in a project that explores the history of touch through the lens of Italian Renaissance anatomy. Jérôme Baudry, Assistant Professor of History of Science and Technology at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, where he also curates the collection of scientific instruments. And his research focuses on the histories of intellectual property and of technical drawing, and the history and sociology of public participation in science. And he's also keen on experimenting with non-traditional methods in history, from digital humanities to the reconstruction of past experiments and artifacts. Then we have Vittoria Falanca, Career Development Fellow and Tutor in French at New College, Oxford, an expert on the role of design and drawing in the writing and thought of the essayist Michel de Montaigne, with broader interests and expertise in art, history and theory, aesthetics, literature and objects, and literature and use. Audrey Borowski, DPhil student in the history of ideas at Queen's College, Oxford, working on Leibniz, and herself a powerhouse in organising innovative interdisciplinary events from the early modern mind to, coming up, the philosophy and critical thinking of AI. So watch this space. And Michael Drollet, Senior Research Fellow in the History of Political Thought at Worcester College, Oxford, who has interest in 18th, 19th and 20th century French philosophy and French political, social and economic thought. These extend to a wide range of topics, including the interface between science, technology and political, social and economic thought. Chairing Paola though for this first session and the discussion in the first instance until 6 p.m. is Marie thébault sorbuguer a research associate professor at the French National Centre for Scientific Research, the CNRS, the co-founder of this writing technologies network and a cultural historian of technology working on the comparative study of inventive practices in Europe throughout the 18th century. So I'll hand over to Marie and look forward to hearing from Paula. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. So we are so pleased today to welcome Paula virtually to Oxford. Um, so welcome back, I should say, that after being educated in physics in Bologna, you stepped into history of science in Oxford, where you complete your PhD in that stimulating environment with Professor Robert Fox and Jim Bennett and others. So you are uh, associate professor of history and history of medicine at Yale University. And you are also curator of the History of Science and Technology Division on, of the Peabody Museum. And this interest in material culture of science is meaningful 
as your reflection investigates the entanglement between material artifacts, knowledge, and the bodies involved in various experimental settings as a way of capturing the relationship between knowledge of the natural world and the arts that arises during the early modern period. And you first explore the dissemination of natural philosophies through the manipulation, experiments, medical uses, and theatrical performances of electrical fluid in the 18th century Italy, which led you to cross the path with the famous Abbe Nole, one of the great men in your life. <laughs> and um, uh, Nole uh, was a prominent figure in, of the dissemination of natural philosophy in France, whose books through bestseller remain highly popular reading for the whole century. So through his Italian journey, journey, you also unveil another side of his activities for the purposes of French industry and manufacturers, which brought you into the machinery of the 18th century French power and state. Pulling together the streets between making, craft and industry, science and state, and the rhetoric of public utility in your most recent work, Artisanal Enlightenment Science and the Mechanical Arts in the Old Regime France, uh, published at Yale University Press in um, 2017, uh, which received many awards, among which the uh, 2019's Louis Gottschalk Prize, Prize for Best Book in the 18th Century, in 18th Century Studies, sorry. You provide important insights for historians of science and tech, but also for historians of the French 18th century more generally. So you succeed indeed in resituating the mechanical arts and the world of making at the heart of the dynamics of the French Enlightenment, tackling key notions such as improvement, useful knowledge, and progress. As the landscape changes with new institutions created by the, by the state to meet the needs for expertise in the first decades of the 18th century with the Royal Academy des Sciences and the Bureau du Commerce, for instance, you focus on a singular uh, intriguing case, the Société des Arts, Society of Arts, envisioned by its member as a state institution, which she never was, but <laughs> that would foster France's, uh, France's colonial and economic expansion. The Society of Arts was an unknown to scholars who have been enlightened um, by uh, Roger Hahn's work, um, also Liliane Hilaire Perez in her book on L'Invention au siècle des Lumières. Whereas England would also create a similar powerful institution in the, in the middle of the 18th century, uh, which lasts until now. The failure of this first, first French society after ju just a few years of activity has raised many questions. And among many other attempts of this kind uh, that emerged at the end of the 1770s, um, such as the Abbé Bodo so Society of Emulation, emulation um, the Museum of uh, Cours de Géblin or Pain de la Blancherie, Salon de la Correspondance des Arts, none of them survives. Where we can therefore grasp the social and intellectual hierarchy and distinction of the French Ancien Regime, their activities remain entangled in practices of patronage and privilege that would, as you demonstrate, clearly ultimate, ultimately undermine uh, its existence. So you also emphasize the legacy of the society whose conceptions of mechanical arts would lead uh, um, some of them, for instance, uh, such as uh, some of them, such as uh, Nollet, <laughs> again, Kenet or Vaucanson, uh, a long career path to play an active role in the administration of the state and in the Academy Royale des Sciences and which could be seen also as a fertile ground from which enterprises such as the Encyclopédie des Arts et Métiers would emerge. Yet beyond the, con the contextual contingency, this inquiry also allows us to re-examine in depth the relationship between science and technology, theory and practice more broadly, 
as their members sought to challenge the hierarchy between the work of the hand and the work of the mind, to shine a light on, but to question to the boundary of the science of arts, advocating a mean, um, means of thinking and controlling the material world, an esprit, spirit of mechanical arts, which relied on a particular creativity, promoting a certain perception of inventive activity rooted in practical material labor and sensorial intelligence, while also being the product of genius. So before our discussion draw out some of these themes that echo our network's ongoing interdisciplinary discussion, and without further delay, I leave the floor to you, Paula. Thank you so much, Marie. Thank you for the beautiful introduction, really generous introduction, as well as for um, the invitation. I am sorry in a way that we are meeting this way virtually, uh, but I'm also delighted. I don't know who else is joining us, but uh, I want to extend my thanks to all of you here and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you in advance to the discussion for what I anticipate will be uh, very interesting. It gives me enormous pleasure to talk at Oxford if only virtually because of what you said. This is where <clears throat> I grew up as, a, as an historian of science. <clears throat> Sorry. That was a little bit of emotion. And, um, and so it, I know that in the audience there are my advisees and this generational gap <clears throat> is really um, fantastic to have the generational continuity more than gap is fantastic to have. And I'm also especially delighted to uh, discuss artisanal enlightenment at this time, in the heat of discussions on the removal of statues, the alternate reality is created by the digital world and the persistent attacks on the humanities. All of this reminds us that uh, a simple thing that we know, uh, that history is dangerous and it is dangerous because it is powerful. And its power uh, it is to challenge commonly held beliefs or to reaffirm them, the power to legitimize the status quo or to shake its foundations. Uh, to say all of this differently, the way we understand the past informs the way we think about the future. This fact, the fact that history is not so much about the past as it is about the future, was very clear to many of the protagonists of my book, from the celebrities like Diderot and D'Alembert to the lesser known artisans uh, who spent considerable energies in constructing historical accounts of their own craft. The notion of a manufactured reality that prompts people to action, a certain kind of action that we noticed more forcefully on January 6 with the attacks on the US Capitol <clears throat> is nothing new. Learned artisans, philosophs, and savants of various kinds in the early modern period were experts at using the printed page, the digital space of their time, for the very same goal. Just like today, they fought over how to write history in order to draw the proper lessons. I wrote Artisanal Enlightenment with one main question in mind. Why was writing on the arts, about the arts, so important in the 18th century? I framed the question this way, but now that I think about it, I wasn't really thinking about writing. Uh, there were many other scholars, there are many other scholars who have done that before me and extremely well. What I was most mostly concerned with was publishing. Why was publishing on the mechanical arts so crucial in the 18th century? And one, one, when one mentions uh, the world of publishing, the print industry and the enlightenment, especially in the context of France, there is one vision that cannot escape anyone, which is the monumental uh, encyclopedia. 
I wanted to decenter the encyclopedia in favor of failed encyclopedic projects that were essential to the creation of the encyclopedia itself. And they were interesting to me, at least in their own terms. I was intrigued by the notion that was present in the Encyclopédie as well as in Francis Bacon's Advancement of Learning, that no work on natural history can be complete unless it includes the mechanical arts. What did it, what did it mean to write a natural history of the mechanical arts? This is what how it was framed at the time, a natural history of the mechanical arts. I couldn't quite understand or grasp this notion that I found so intriguing and to which the first half of my book is, the first third of my book is dedicated. The question was, became, why did it become so important in France in the second half of the 17th century we call Burr up until the 1751 and later with the publication of uh, the Encyclopédie, why did writing a natural history of the arts and encyclopedia of the arts was so important? Artisanal Enlightenment addresses these questions by looking at how learned artisans responded to the savant's interest in their own craft. It foregrounds a figure to, that I found inexistent in the secondary literature, the artist. The artist is an actor's category. I didn't make it up. I, it's a word that I encountered many times in my explorations that Marie has so beautifully and generously uh, described, whether I was working on the silk industry or the Abenole or the Societe des Arts, an interest I shared because Nolay was a member of the Societe des Arts. And I want to acknowledge, and I should have done this uh, from the very beginning, the, the, the discovery that uh, Oliver, Oliver Courcel, together with Roger Hahn, uh, did of this fantastic archive, private archive in Germany that enabled me to focus on the Societe des Arts uh, with new sources in, in mind. And so in these documents, as well as in publications of various kinds that I was reading, I encountered this word artiste that uh, attracted me, intrigued me because it wasn't the artist in the ordinary sense of the word. And alternative words were available in French. Artisan is a word that existed. And so I became curious about this word, uh, really looking at uh, dictionaries, uh, 17th century and, and then the, the Académie Française uh, dictionary, but also Pierre Richelet's dictionary of the French language published in 1701. And what I found was that there was a change uh, at the turn of the 18th century crystallized in Pierre Richelieu's um, dictionary in which the meaning of the word artist changed. Whereas in the earlier, earlier tradition, French, like uh, many other Romance languages, shared the meaning of the word artist as artista from it, it, the Italian for, or in, coming from Latin, for somebody who works mostly on artillery and other mechanical, uh, sorry, chemical or alchemical arts. There is this transition from that meaning of the world to a new, really French uh, uh, meaning, which I found in Pierre Richelet's 1701 dictionary, which is an artisan with esprit. Esprit is this, we all know, uh, those early the early modernists among us, that it is a, a, a very French word that is difficult to translate in English into English with just one word. There are many uh, things that go into it, is about wit, is about discernment, is about intelligence, it is about manners, politeness, all of this combined. And um, in recent works on the Enlightenment, the, esprit, the notion of esprit philosophique 
has been was associated to the early narratives on the Enlightenment, how savant thought about themselves as enlightened. They were enlightened because they had these esprit philosophique. So I was intrigued by finding by the the, the, the fact of finding uh, this word esprit in relationship to an artisanal figure, an artisan that is not an artisan. It is an artisan in the sense that he lives on the work of the hand, uh, but is more than an artisan in virtue of, uh, of his esprit. And I'm using the gender, he, the masculine gender, because this is a homosocial world. I haven't encountered one woman in the sources I've been looking. So it's a deliberate choice. Um, and so as an actor's category, it, this artist was telling me something uh, that I wanted to explore more. And also thinking about the classical theme of the relationship between the scholar and the craftsman, the artisan and the savant, this artist complicated, the existence of the artist uh, complicated the dichotomy. Um, I, I became intrigued. I wanted to make sense of uh, the artist in the context, in the French context that um, generated this uh, definition, this new definition. I also approached the Société des Arts and the story of the artist uh, trying to move away from a, another classical approach to the relationship between artists, art and science or the arts and the sciences in the early modern period, in the sense that um, the, the classic approach to the theme uh, has been to trace the artisan's contributions to science. This, especially in the context of the scientific revolution, from Paolo Rossi to Pamela Smith, it seems that that was uh, a big concern. I wasn't interested so much in the, uh, in the contributions to science, in the relationship with savants as much, or uh, natural philosophers as much as I was interested in this artisanal world in its own terms, to amplify, to um, highlight the heterogeneity of this world that the artist was uh, telling me. So artist, it, artist is, um, I will show, uh, is a, the, the artists were self-aware and used this term in contrast to artisan or um, other other words that, that, that are available in they were available in the French vocabulary of the time. So on the one hand, my book is a history of the artist, an early history of the artist. On the other, it is an analysis of the political relevance of the encyclopedic projects on the mechanical arts. So in this short introduction, I like to focus on the first component, and I trust that the conversation, the discussion will focus, will enable me to discuss the second. Um, so I, I want to show you a, a few uh, visuals, a few images that when I found them really helped me crystallize my thoughts uh, about the artist. So I'm going to share the screen to show you, um, to start with really the cover of the book that Yale University Press so uh, beautifully uh, manipulated. So uh, this is a plate from a book that the court historian to Louis XIV, Philippe Bion, produced in 1676. The book is about uh, architecture, sculpture, painting, and related arts, the arts that depend on these three, as Felibion says. And I was looking at these along with other treatises on mechanical arts to look for images, to find images of artisans at work. So I was really scanning all the available plates to see how artisans were represented. So Philippian is of course not an artisan, he's court historian. Um, 
And so he writes this uh, treatise and there are several illustrations. When I saw this one in particular, I found it arresting. Arresting because of the chair. The position of the chair is suggestive. It suggests the presence of a workman, an artisan, and yet it, his irrelevance because it's not represented. So on the one hand, artisans are there at the work desk, but they don't really matter when it comes to writing, to publishing on the mechanical arts. And this really um, summarizes how I saw the savant's approach to writing encyclopedic projects on the mechanical arts. They had to take into account artisans, but not because artisans could produce any writing themselves. And I, I give you here one quotation from this book, which I uh, found illuminating. I don't know what it is. Yes, this is what it is. So he, Philippian here says, of, he tells of his encounters with uh, the workmen. He realized when he had to write about these arts, he had to meet and ask questions to workmen. He had to enter the shops, visit the workshop, the workshops, consider their machines and their tools, consult with them about the various usages, and often enlighten himself with the artisans about the different names that they give to the same things. And then he says, and it is this that was the most distressing. In fact, the word he uses in French is pain. Is pain. Um, and Again, this notion, this ethnography of the arts that uh, includes the artisans as speechless or cacophonic beings uh, was something that I found. So I'm offering this quotation to as an example of um, my reading of the savant, savant's approach to writing an encyclopedia of the arts, a total work on all the mechanical arts. This of course echoes something that scholars of the enlightenment ha have often associated in particular, or, or not in particular, specifically to the encyclopedia you often find uh, that Diderot was the first to, to enter and his um, acolytes were the first to enter shops and workshops and talk to the artisans. Whereas this is the top, it was very common in the early modern uh, period, a sort of catabasis, a descent to the belly of the city to see the dirt and then uh, reemerge, pu purified somehow. We have it in Montaigne, you know, one of the discussions is an expert, maybe we can discuss that and later. So uh, this notion of this ethnography of craft, these encounters I found intriguing and it is something that is still with me. I hope I, I will develop this in a different work. What we find also in previous works and as well as in the preliminary discourse to the encyclopedia is this notion that artisans are unable to talk about their arts because they use the same word to identify several tools or they use multiple words for one for the same tool. And so the, the way that Diderot and D'Alembert saw themselves was in the role of obstetrics animorum, the midwives of the minds of the spirits. They had to help artisans extract the words from the speechless mouth or cacophonic mouths of the artisans. <clears throat> And then, of course, there is this motto in the preliminary discourse that probably belongs to Diderot rather than D'Alembert, which is that in the, in the workshop, it is the moment that speaks, not the artist. And here, 
he does use the word artist. And that stood in contrast with what I was finding in the sources. And again, just to entertain you, I, I'm going to show you just the visuals, but the very same concept was uh, in, in, in the text as well. So uh, this is a print I particularly love. It's so explicit that I feel even silly in commenting it, but basically this is a, a print from the late 17th century French uh, um, called the artisan. The artisan pulls the devil uh, by its tail. And this is actually a way of saying in French, which means work, working hard. So the artisan is working hard. And is working hard. The artisan is here, well dressed, almost a nobleman, and he has signs on his head and industry in his hand, and he is working hard. He's pulling the devil uh, from the tail. And why is he working hard? What does his work consist of? Consist of? It's not his own art. You see the products and tools of uh, the arts at the bottom of the picture. Uh, the, the hard work is to combine, to put together the goals of artisanal work, which is on the one hand, on top, honor, and the flames of honor, and at the bottom, profit. So this is the hard work of the artisan and his damnation, combining honor and profit. So what I found interesting about this is the self-reflection. This is an engraver, an artisan, reflecting on artisans. At this time, the word artist is not available in the sense of artisan uh, with esprit. At the same time, so same street, uh, Saint-Jacques in Paris, other uh, engravers workshop, we have a collection, beautiful collection of satirical prints that mocks the very fashionable genre of costume books, usually descriptions of people in various European towns later to extra European places. Uh, here you have uh, costumes, grotesque, grotesque costumes, that is a collection of illustrations where you have artisans depicted in the clothes, the clothes of the artisans are the tools and products of their art. And what these prints are telling really is that it doesn't really matter who the artisan is, because the art is what, um, uh, what you see here. They, are, they lend, artisans lend uh, faces and hands to the art. But as the, the, the proverb said, uh, art is long. And so that is what matters really. And so I see this as a satire that an artist engraver, was doing, performing his own esprit for other audiences. There is also, of course, the proverb that you don't judge. I mean, it's untranslatable in English, so I'll skip it. I'll come back to this if there are questions, but it is about clothing and essence, who you are and what you wear, which is which goes to the heart, to the heart of the costume books as well. The final, I think, yes, uh, image I wanted to show you is this one, the circles back to Nolet and how I got to the artist and the Société des Arts in the first place. So this is a plate in the very fashionable lectures on um, experimental physics that Nollet um, published from the lectures he gave to the French uh, Dauphin. And here he is, what, what you see is not Nollet, it is Nollet's teacher. This is an artisan, the enameler to the king, Jean Rau. And he is portrayed here at the lamp, the enameler's lamp. And you see how the engraver has paid attention to the facial features. So you can really identify if you know him, the person. 
At the same time, in this illustration, we see an assistant, an assistant that is anonymized, even though he has face, a face and hands, you cannot really tell who he is, pretty much in tune and in line with the empty chair that we saw with Felibian. And so what this image is doing and that we, uh, what I found in several writings by artists is the artist using the way of writing of this about, about the arts of the savant to distinguish himself from other workmen, from other practitioners, from other artisans. So you have the artist genre represented with identifiable features and the other, the artisan, um, uh, represented as somebody who's, who can be uh, replaced by somebody else. So I'll stop sharing and come back to the screen. So uh, this is what the story, uh, this is what I wanted to emphasize about the artist and the artisanal world, that is not, it, it is heterogeneous, but also that it um, appropriates dynamics, social dynamics of typical of the ancien regime. And even when we have the Société des Arts um, and that, whose ambitions are to serve, the, to become an academy of the mechanical arts that the state will draw on when it comes to assessing inventions that will serve the colonial or commercial uh, expansion of the state. Even then, we have these dynamics at play that ultimately undermine the, the future of the Société des Arts. And that really gives us this uh, impression of ancien regime society where artisans are eager uh, to acquire higher status at the expense of the other artisans that they, the artists conceptualize as um, mere craftsmen bound to uh, routine and mindless. So to uh, conclude this brief introduction and go back to the point about history, one and the dangers of history and the power of history. Uh, one of the, I analyze in the book, the various genre that um, uh, artists use when they write about the mechanical arts, about their own art. And one um, uh, point that emerged powerfully and that really interested me very much was this idea of history, the history of the mechanical arts, the history of astronomy, for example, or other sciences. Um, this is, a, they say, is a should be a different kind of history. It doesn't really matter that uh, facts happened for real or not. The history must be a history of linear progress, must show how from one invention we got to a more, a better one, a more advanced one, to convey uh, this notion of progress and uh, the idea that uh, you learn from history how the mechanical arts should be and the sciences should be cultivated. So it's what we call the Whiggish history that we see in action here. And the point I want to make today, and it is something I'm thinking uh, for the book I'm writing now, is this notion of a printed reality. The printed page creates an artificial reality that circulates fast in the 18th century, uh, faster than other means. So it is representation and medium and as a representation has a very important role. It conveys ideas about something that are not necessarily true, that can be artificial and yet uh, push people into action. And so this I found uh, most powerful and I land there. Thank you so much. 
thank you so much, Paula. <laughs> it was really a, a fantastic, uh, fascinating and rich presentation and which brings really new, um, new kind of idea about, about history and the genealogy also of uh, technology that those actors are actually uh, making. Um, we, we, uh, if you want, we, we, if you want to keep the time uh, as much as possible, um, I would propose to um, uh, that we group uh, maybe a three uh, questions. We uh, three as uh, a three intervention of uh, uh, Victoria, um, uh, Victoria and uh, Audrey uh, as well, and uh, so uh, you can uh, make a collective uh, answer, and we will then. Uh, um, uh, as to Jerome and, and me too. So um, I'm maybe inviting uh, uh, Victoria uh, to <laughs> open your camera and, uh, and... Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for such an inspiring and powerful presentation. So um, first of all, I want to say how much I enjoyed your book, which I found beautifully written, so clear and extremely useful to think about a range of questions that have become prominent in a variety of fields in, in recent years. And they frequently arise, as Marie said uh, in the opening, in our discussions in our writing technology uh, group about writing and craft, the body and technology, the hand and the mind, invention and the disembodied practical sensorial knowledge. So most of these questions were comprehensively examined in such a detailed and nuanced way that I must confess I find it difficult to find an angle that you haven't already thought about. So instead, what, what I thought I would do today would simply be to invite you to talk a little bit more about one of the threads of your book, which was the most compelling to me, which is the intersection between theory and practice. This theme is really, um, it crosses uh, all your chapters and it's really key to your book's argument about the rise of the figure of the artist, an artisan with esprit. So I wanted to ask you if you could perhaps provide some additional details and answers about what was specific about the 18th century French model or the French context you describe, using both um, the material of the book and what you knew from your previous research on 18th century Italy and what's coming next is, seems really fascinating to me too. So as you acknowledge in your work, discussions about the intersection, the connection, the hierarchy, the dichotomy, the opposition and challenges on all these discussions between theory and practices, they were occurring elsewhere as well. So in Britain and in Italy, for instance, and also long before the 18th century. I encountered in my own research similar discussions in Italian Renaissance medical writings, where some anatomists, not all of them, were presented just like your artists as skilled artisans endowed with both the ingenium of the mind and the diligentia of sophisticated practical skills, by contrast to other physicians who were focused on theory and also to butchers and barbers who did not think about what they were really doing. And I also encountered in my previous research about taste, taste cooks in 18th century France who were keen likewise to appear both as learned in food matters in the chemistry of flavors and in philosophical aesthetics about the nature of taste and also as experts in the practical preparation of delicate meals which distinguished them both from the philosophers and from ordinary cooks. So it seems like the, the, the same kind of discussions was happening, happening there as well. So I guess I would be curious to know what the conditions of possibility of political discussions about theory and practice could be. So theoretically, we could think that all forms of craft engage both the hand and the mind. So such discussions could potentially become commonplace debates everywhere. However, you made it clear in your book that not all artisans were to be considered as artists, but were all crafts susceptible to acquire the status of art. Were all the artists to be found in every sorts of craft? Why were the nine focus areas you described electively chosen in the Société des Arts? Was it because of the materials employed, so organic and, or and non-organic noble matter? Was it because the set of skills required, so they were more difficult to develop? the intellectual the dimension of the practice, like for the clock workers, uh, clock makers who needed mathematical and astronomical knowledge and surgeons who relied on anatomy? Was it the complexity and the social utility of the tools and machines produced? Or just 
these because these artists could write using words and their claim for expertise and political utility. So in a word, what are the conditions of possibility for political discussions about the interaction between theory and practice? And what was specific about the French Enlightenment model you described in your book, which again, I really found fascinating, wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Victoria. I would just jump to um, Audrey. Uh, if you want to, do, and, and after uh, Victoria, and after. Thank you, Marie. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Paola. That was, it was a very, very interesting uh, book indeed. I'll jump right into it. And I think my question, which will be quite short, uh, is actually, it draws more on a um, conceptual, uh, maybe slightly more philosophical background. And it concern, it, it actually consists of Two little questions, if if you can address them. I'm wondering. I was wondering to what extent there is maybe a reconfiguration of the concept of genius. Whether these artists uh, consider uh, conceive of of a particular kind of material genius, so quote unquote. And I was also wondering to what extent these artists uh, sought to challenge the mind body dualism. You know, we have Descartes and. And, 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 and the whole philosophical legacy after that. And to what extent they are in discussion and dialogue with the philosophical debates occurring at that time, to what extent maybe they are trying to push back or they are contributing to, to the philosophical debates of that time. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Audrey. Victor. Thank you so much, Paula, for your really fascinating talk. I want to echo everything that Victoria said about how you so beautifully encapsulated and crystallized so many of the problematics and questions and research strands that our network has been thinking about for a few years now. So thank you really um, for, your, for your book and for your talk today. Um, I had sort of pre-prepared a question that was related to my own research on design. And as you were talking, I was thinking about a second question that I really wanted to ask you. So I hope you'll indulge me in asking both, but feel free to only answer one of them. <laughs> so my first question about design. Um, lately, I've been thinking about Galileo's uses of disegno in his Il Saggiatore from 1623 and what they tell us about the overlaps in scientific and artistic method. I'm curious whether in the course of research in your book, you came across any interesting uses of design concepts or design methods, or even use, uses of the word design this, uh, in the years between sort of Galileo, Galileo and the Enlightenment. And what, if anything, Enlightenment mechanical arts owe to earlier scientific appropriations of artistic language and method. Um, I'm curious too about whether you see the role of design or design or design in the story you tell about the emergence of the figure of the artist and his self-figuration and particularly whether design might be a bridge between the artistic and the scientific in the early modern period. So in our modern day, of course, we, we use design in both disciplines. We think about the design of an experiment or the design of a scientific research project, for example. Um, and we also think of design as an important step or, or kind of um, step or, or, or part of the process for artists. But we tend to see these two things as methodologically very different. Um, I think for early modern actors, artists, scientists, people in between, they were probably much closer. Um, the second question is about social value, hierarchy and power. I was really struck by your opening claim that history is dangerous because it's powerful. And I think it connects really beautifully to one of the claims in the introduction to your book where you say um, the artist consistently presented himself as superior to other craftsmen because his work did not consist of rote practice, but resulted from his ingenuity and ability to combine practical skill, creative design and inventive intelligence. So from the very beginning, you, you show that the artist as a figure is attempting to elevate or revalue his social status. And this is nothing new, of course, in a way. So there are plenty of debates in, in Renaissance Italy about the status of painting and whether it ought to be a liberal art. And these were debates that were at least partially fought on kind of semantic turf on the back of the keyword disegno um, as a way to sort of intellectualize and theorize painting, but still retains through that word disegno a link to the manual and the gestural graphic act. So I wanted to ask you whether you could think perhaps now about the role of marginalization and the figuration of the artiste. Why is it that some forms of esprit or design become important, powerful, socially useful during the enlightenment, and some forms of design become sort of 
less so. <laughs> and only recently, really, do we see a resurgence, for example, in the art historical value of drawings um, beyond the sort of merely utilitarian role. So we're still living somehow in the legacy of that marginalization, perhaps. Um, so this is an, a hierarchization that is, um, I think, already happening in, in centuries prior to the ones that you're looking at. So we might think of a figure like Bernard Palissy, for example, who's still now treated as, a, as at best a kind of pseudoscientist, sometimes even called an anti-intellectual. But certainly during his own life, he was really at great pains to constitute himself as a thinker as much as a doer, and as someone who possessed faculties of design, i.e. of conception, of planning, of thought, of intellectual figuration, and not just manual skill. You spoke towards the end of your talk about the rise of the artiste paradoxically relied on him further entrenching some of these categories and binaries as much as kind of pushing back against them. Um, and what is our role, I guess, now and responsibility now as modern scholars and historians um, with respect to these binaries and hierarchies? Thank you. So it should be very short, right, because we have six minutes to do all of this. We may need to overrun a little bit beyond our six o'clock okay. deadline, I have to say. All right. So the first thing I want to say, thank you so much for these perceptive questions. Um, some of them are, I can easily answer thinking of the book. Others are taking me uh, to different directions and I'm very excited about that. So I'll start with the um, with the more familiar one, the theory practice uh, divide. Uh, that's very much an intervention I wanted to make, a historiographical intervention uh, I wanted to make. Um, Victoria, I, as you say, uh, there is there has been fantastic work. I studied this work. I don't know if um, others of works I read and absorbed are in the audience. You know who you are. I read uh, all of this um, work that really blurred the boundaries between theory and practice, um, sort of undoing this idea that science and technology are two different domains. And, uh, and so I am building on that. I don't have anything new to say with respect to that conversation. What I thought the artists were doing that enabled me to say something new was this boundary work, uh, the boundary work that they, they were doing in their own time, trying to differentiate between theory and practice, between the sciences and the arts. And so this is not something, I'm not trying to rejuvenate these distinctions that uh, we, we know cannot um, stand the test of history. At the same time, I was intrigued by the idea, by this insistence on our, in, in the writings by the artist on the difference between theory and practice. And so why were they trying to do this boundary work? You, you know, they went to great extent. Um, you write, if you're an artisan, artist, okay, in France in the 18th century, you take time from productive work uh, to write. And so you, you have to see a convenience in doing that. So what is the convenience? On top of that, you as an artist are also confronting an elite and a powerful elite of uh, savants who is very skeptical of writings by artisans and who take to the printed page to insult and offend them and so because they don't master the French, the French language. And so why do they do that? There must be something very powerful. And so this is where the political aspect of the game uh, really emerges powerfully to me. Uh, they are trying to advocate for a specific kind of expertise they represent, which uh, is based on the power of making machines that work. And these machines from a watch that may be employed to find longitude at sea to um, weaving looms and other kinds of things are the machines through which the colonial machine, and I'm borrowing from um, McClellan and Rigour uh, definition, the, colon the French colonial machine can operate. And so they're making this claim that Savant's knowledge is uh, too abstract to make 
machines really work. And the example I want to give that they give is the uh, uh, cycloid, Huygens cycloid, presented as the potential solution for finding longitude at sea. So if you have a pendulum clock that oscillates on a cycloid, then you, it, those oscillations are isochronous independently of where the machine is. And so whatever happens to this machine, so it can be used at sea. You need to build a clock that uh, is able to, to, to oscillate on a cycloid, which means using gears and other machines. And what the artists are saying, especially the clock makers, who are the most vocal among the artists, uh, is that by introducing so many um, pieces, you introduce friction and therefore the, 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 the machine, the, um, the resulting machine will never perform as intended. And so you need a completely different frame of mind where they also criticize the price that the British Board of Longitude puts in place because the price is for an individual, whereas what they are after is a state-sponsored institution where collaborative work mm -hmm. among artisans with different skills can happen. So this is to quickly uh, explain the politics that I saw at stake in this writing. Uh, publishing. And again, I say writing, but it is really publishing. It makes a difference. It needs to go public. It needs to reach audiences that are powerful and uh, widespread. On the genius question, the mind-body dualism, uh, Audrey, I think it was your question. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, they, we do have that. We have this notion of genius comes up. It's often conflated with esprit, but there is also this uh, philosophy, if we wish to call it that way, this discourse on invention and what invention is and why the artist is so special. There is a self-reflection uh, of the artist on the artist himself, in which they talk about this kind of inspiration that comes almost from the Godhead. They talk about the idea that uh, arrived to their mind. They talk about the inspiration that they are able to, to catch in the moment as it happens in the workshop. In other words, what they are trying to, to say, and here I, I reconnect to the previous question, is that the, savant, the savants have a completely wrong understanding of the practice of the arts. Whereas they think that the condition of possibility for an encyclopedic project is that the arts develop slowly through time, that inventions don't usually occur, that progress, it takes an amount of time that is almost biblical, and therefore you have time to produce this description of the art. The artists are saying, no, innovation happens all the time in the workshop because the practice is always unique. It's never, even though it seems the same, it's not the same. It appears the same only if you take into account the craftsmen and the artisans. But the artist is the one who is able to catch the moment as it happens. So the, the possibility of innovation as it happens. And this is genius. This is you know, what we call serendipity. They don't use that word, but it's combined. And that again takes me to the notion of um, the sensorial knowledge they really explicitly discuss in which it's no longer the Cartesian world of the mind and the, and, and the hand. We have the bot, the knowing bot. So my colleagues who wrote the mindful hand, this is even more, it's not just the hand, is the body as this medium of knowledge. You need all the senses. And they also play with this idea of the deformed artisan that sometimes is used in, in literature, especially by the savant and in mythology with the myth of Vulcan as the deformed god. 
uh, they they say that you can turn the, the disability can be an advantage if you're nearsighted you can be a fantastic goldsmith for example or a petition etc etc and they play with that to say that you need a special body uh, to be a skilled uh, artist to be a special artisan and the question on design which is really the most difficult and uh, very intriguing for me so it really depends the short answer is no i haven't encountered the, the word design but then if we use it as an analytical category rather than actors category we we see that uh, at, at play in many ways so the first that comes to mind is the notion of invention uh, and, and, and how to present new machines. And um, I have in mind, for example, a, 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 um, an instrument that an object, an artifact that does not survive and that I would have loved to, to see, which is Leroy's uh, um, clock for the king. So Leroy watchmaker, clockmaker makes a special uh, clock for um, the, the, the king. This is a clock that you keep, mantle clock. Uh, so you keep on your cabinet. It's used for the levée du roi, which is a highly ceremonial process during which is a public event when the king wakes up and you need a watch, you need a clock. And the way he makes it is he makes transparent the uh, back of the back door of the watch so that the king can see the mechanism. And so this is really a beautiful way through which Leroy is making a claim to his esprit. And they see this as design in a sense. Uh, it's a new design, he boasts of it, he publishes it, he, tell, he tells his readers that he made the instrument for, for the king. And this is where the signature is also. It is on the front, yes, but really the engraved signature of the watchmaker is in the back. Uh, I also see this notion of design at stake in the visual culture of, uh, that we see in, in the books published by artists in which uh, deliberate choices are made in when it comes to how to represent machines in ways that give an idea of the object and its function, and at the same time protects secrecy in terms of being able to replicate that machine. So I also see that as design now in a broader context that I think is closer to, to, to what, I think, what you are thinking. Uh, so I'll stop here. I, I like to, uh, I hope I've been, um, they've been satisfied with the questions, but please get back to me. I, I, I love all these questions. They're very uh, good to think with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paola. Thank you very much, uh, Paola, for a brilliant presentation and fascinating book. Um, I had a question about the, the artist, the figure of the artist, uh, but you've already uh, talked quite a lot about it and uh, we are uh, running a bit late. So I, I'll ask just a very short question. Um, more of a social or sociological question on the artist. Um, you insisted a lot on the fact that um, this was an actor's category that was used by the artist to distinguish themselves from the artisans. And I was wondering also if in this figure that you describe as being halfway between the savant and the artisan, the artists were also eager to distinguish themselves from the savant. Was it also part of their uh, Sorry, I missed, I missed the word if they were eager to distinguish themselves from... From the, from the savants. Okay. As well. Not just from the artisans, but also from the savants. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so now I'm, I'm asking my... That it was difficult because <laughs> I have so many things to, <laughs> to say. Um, what I wanted to point out is uh, it's, yes, to question you about the um, uh, useful knowledge, actually. In your <laughs> earlier work, uh, you have often emphasized the role of performance and the question of curiosity and pleasure. Uh, which were particularly important in the ex electrical experiment, uh, which involved women and polite audience and so on. And I was wondering 
as the main focus of the book is also the mechanical art and mechanical ingenuity as being useful for the aims of the state uh, benefit uh, benefit for the production, how could we resituate this dimension within the broader approach of the arts, with an S seen as a coherent category that encompass the gathering of all kinds of arts of making, including fine arts and rhetorics and uh, all kinds of arts. So the notion of useful knowledge uh, seems to me, uh, to edge out, to minimize a little bit this notion of pleasure and curiosity. Yet technical efficiency, efficiency isn't restricted to economic and industrial purposes. Uh, you can think in terms of uh, curious device, ingenious prowess, the promise of improving and transforming everyday life from aesthetic setting to functional convenience and um, or the innovation generated by the search of embellishment, for instance, intending to create spectacular effects through control artifice. So in short, um, where are the art agréable, <laughs> which remain to me uh, an important feature in the 18th French, um, but not only 18th century technical culture and often joined to the useful arts. So the unified conception of the art utile agréable uh, well, as keeping all the register together makes sense because it's underlying the intelligibility of technical processes and procedure that traverse the different fields of application. And so uh, are useful and pleasure, pleasurable, I don't know if I can say the arts are uh, an unsurpassable contradiction, where the, or uh, its dynamics in tension along the century, or does it reflect, it's another question, uh, rather a problem of terminology and translation, as if the arts does exist in English, uh, in the society of arts, uh, which include fine arts as well. Uh, techniques doesn't, as you know, and, and technology doesn't uh, fit here. Uh, and we often translated uh, technique as useful knowledge. So it's emphasizing the utility as the only mode of existence of technique. So, and that was just a reflection. And um, Michael, if you want to, to jump in and... Um, uh, ask uh, a short uh, question and... Yeah, I, I want to pursue Marie's point. Um, it seems, I mean, I, in, in reading the last chapter, uh, particularly in relation to Bocasson, um, there's something that's really, really interesting here. Uh, we, we've, got this, we've got this imperative about productivity and production and this all serving a public good and serving the interests of the state. And so there's a, so Vocasso wants to, in fact, create uh, a mechanism and, uh, in, which, in which humans act increasingly in a routinized, mechanical, mechanized way. And so we have literally a transfer, I mean, we can, we can, we can move away from the notion of a machine and flip that around to machine um. And, and this raises a huge kind of paradox because if the encyclopedic enterprise is that knowledge equals power equals freedom, and that what we see here through the relocation of skills into the machine, we actually have the opposite. We have a disempowerment and a loss of freedom. So in, in a sense, it, it, it picks up on a question, the question that Marie asked, which is that labor ceases to be pleasurable and therefore it ceases to be creative in the way in which it offers some kind of emancipation, uh, relates to some forms of human creativity. Rather, it, it, it becomes totally mechanized and the spontaneous and free elements, which is so crucial to the encyclopedic enterprise, then becomes completely effaced from the program here. Um, and I just have another very quick question, because in reading this, Thank there's you. so much Foucault in this. That's just a point. No, no, no. 
So go ahead. So I'll take that as a comment, Michael, and uh, well taken. I, uh, I have very little to say. I think that's exactly what I was trying to accomplish. And so I'm glad you read it that way. Uh, in terms of the um, savant artist, yes, the artist is differentiating, distinguishing himself from the savant as well, because the savant are too theoretical to actually help the state advance with its uh, uh, colonial and commercial ambitions. So I'll keep that short. I'm sorry if I hope that clarifies. All right. So. Um, on the question of useful knowledge, Marie, I think uh, we would need to write a book. There is so much to say, and it, it, will, it would have to be more than just one of us, because I think we need from different angles and we all have something to say. Um, but on the very quickly on the issue of pleasure and uh, ag agreeable knowledge or pleasurable knowledge, I think, um, this is what I was trying to get at with the section on Nollet and his school of experimental physics in which the idea is to entertain and educate at the same time. And again, we have here a, a political project because the education of the elites is essential in order to invite them to pay attention to the mechanical arts and identify the expertise of the artist. But it is also true that Nollet is deploying a repertoire of uh, entertaining uh, lectures that had been in place for decades in France and uh, also in England, as many uh, colleagues have discussed. Uh, there is also something that Lilian Perez has written about, which is, I think she has written, uh, uh, on, the, on the spectacle of efficiency. Uh, the idea of seeing machines that work, this is, and you're on work too, uh, in, the in the French provinces with the intendant, we have this, the tests that were carried out on new machines, on inventions, and they are public. And there is this interest in, in observing and being there at the spectacle of efficiency. Uh, that, and there is a recent uh, work on the guillotine that I think encapsulates that spectacle of efficiency in a sort of darker uh, way. I'll leave it there and I'll let uh, anyone else to uh, chime in. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, Thank you. Really fantastically um, dense um, and efficient, <laughs> as well as beautiful responses. Um, so yeah, we now we now kind of throw open the floor. Um, we invite you to ask a question if you if you'd like to um, by writing question in the chat, just the word question, and I'll call on you. Um, feel free to turn on your camera, um, show us your faces, whether or not you'd like to ask a question. Um, or if you prefer um, to type a question, I can also read that out for you in the chat. Perhaps while we wait for that to happen, I could I could hop in and ask a question of my own, um, which is that as a kind of uh, literary scholar by training, I was really struck by the book ending of your, your narrative in the book by, um, it's been evoked already, the, the myth, the kind of emblematic myth of Hephaestus or Vulcan. And then in the final chapter, that kind of concern with the metaphorical use of the machine. Um, so I suppose in a, in a funny way, coming at what Michael was saying, but maybe with my literary hat on, I'm kind of interested in that sort of arc of um, imagery that's, um, that's being, I want to say played with, but of course it, it's being put into practice, it's being made to do work. So between the image of Vulcan and the image of the machine at the end that's standing for the mind, among other things. You've also got in the middle this focus on improvement, um, theory, practice and improvement, chapter three. So one of the stories that seemed to be in play for me across the whole span of the book um, was this sense that humans are improving themselves in certain ways or extending their capacities. And in fact, in certain imaginary strands, they come to resemble machines more and more. And I'm thinking of the fantastic illustrations you showed us of the, the kind of um, mocking illustrations of the uh, the costumes um, with the serrure, for example, who his body is the forge, right? Um, so rather than, um, yeah, 
the the mind going into the machine, the <laughs> the the body becomes mechanized. So I'm wondering what, if any, might be the kind of counter images to that story that goes from the body of Vulcan to the to the machine that is imbued with a mind. Are there are there images, myths, emblems that kind of resist that trend or complicate that story a bit that I'm kind of really um, boiling down very quickly there? Hmm. Help me work on this idea of the counter image. Because uh, I, I do see the um, uh, continuity there. It, more than with the deformed body of Vulcan, more with the um, uh, with the uh, other version of Vulcan that circulates in Paris with uh, a statue carved out of marble in which Vulcan is this Herculean figure that really exemplifies this idea of the artist uh, as um, this powerhouse for, for the state. Um, in terms of the, uh, so, and, and here I'm now reconnecting to both the question on useful knowledge and um, the esprit in, in the machine. Um, there is this idea of progress as, in, in the artist's writing, I mean, there is this idea of progress as tied to inventions and what we would call technologies. Um, machines, uh, artifacts, things that uh, are made. And more than with the moral virtues as it was, you know, it's a parallel discourse, it doesn't disappear and is, it precedes that. Uh, but in, so I think useful knowledge, we cannot really translate technique with uh, useful knowledge, as you say, Marie, that cuts out a, 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 an important component of that, which has to do with the fine arts, with beauty, with aesthetic pleasures. Um, I allude to that when I discuss in the epilogue, Volker's The Worldling uh, wrote before, well before the earthquake of Lisbon that changed his mind. But Voltaire conceptualizes this idea of the Iron Age uh, in which that is better of the golden age of Eden because uh, of the machines and the progress that humans have been able to produce over time. And so he says famously, Adam and Eve ha had their dirty fingernails and they were naked, whereas now we live in this age of comfort. And one of the points uh, I, I wanted to make is that Voltaire is able to produce that because he lives in a material world in which that is shaped by the work of the artist, whether it is the pharmacist that produces his medicines or the goldsmith that makes his jewelry or uh, the clockmaker that makes his watches, et cetera, et cetera. He is living in a material world uh, that is produced by the very same artist who are conceptualizing this notion of the bien public. This is what we, we translate with, uh, um, useful knowledge, really the common good, the, the French is the bien public, they are uh, constructing it as tied to inventions, to the mechanical arts, to the kind of expertise they and not the savants are able to produce for, for the French state. So I think all of that uh, goes together I hope I have addressed uh, that question. Those questions are very profound and would deserve a much more extended discussion. No, thank you. I mean, you have an amazing knack for answering three things at once, which <laughs> seems <laughs> seems unfair, but it's terrific. Um, I can see in the chat, Anna Guanini has asked a question. I don't know, Anna, whether you would like to ask it yourself. Would you like to turn on your camera or shall I just read it? I'm happy to read it. So she writes, I um, Mm -hmm. A curiosity to what extent an aesthetic dimension was part of the artist's profile. Oh, sorry, Anna, go ahead. <laughs> to what extent it was a, a part of the artist's profile, most notably with regard to their engagement in publishing and presenting to the public their very distinctive character. 
Yeah, so it's difficult to distinguish the Societe des Arts initially was called Societe de Beaux Arts. Uh, it's, it's difficult to distinguish in our own terms, uh, to apply our own uh, notions to th this time period in which, you know, you have goldsmith, goldsmiths really not, not so much, but uh, metal blacksmiths, they are making uh, engravers, painters, they are, all are part of this microcosm of the artist. So their notion of the useful, as Marie was saying, does include the aesthetic, the pleasurable, the luxurious, I would say. This is a, a, a group of artisans that is producing goods for the elites, for the court. Ultimately, their ambition is to be ennobled in some sort. Uh, they they um, partake of this ancien regime um, philosophy of way of life in which success is measured by social status. And there have been cases in which artists had been literally ennobled, turned into noblemen, or given uh, a residence at the Louvre, etc., other forms of privilege uh, at the time. Uh, that translates into a higher social status. So uh, I think this notion of utility, you know, really deserves some deeper engagement and a multidisciplinary approach to really put it in sharp focus. Thank you. Um, and I can see Pierre Von Au has a question. Would you like to ask the question on camera? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I don't know if it's working uh, here. Sorry. Um, hi. Um, hi, Paola. Well, thanks so much for, for this event. Um, I just have a very quick question, which is um, kind of related to um, what all of you were saying earlier. And it's a terminological question, rather. Um, it's about when, when I heard you speaking of this distinction again between the savant, the artist, the artist, and um, and the the, the the craftsman or the artisan. I was wondering if like um, this kind of reinvestment of the notion of artist, which pre-existed, but like is the, the the signified is just turned around. If if you observed something similar when it comes to the term tool, instrument. And um, and machine. I just I was just um, curious to know if like you you would equate the same like trichotomy or like trilogy between the tool that would be more um, in the in the sort of realm of the of the artisan and um, you know having the machine or like the invention, uh, which are two terms that are, that exist in English and in French, rather on the side mm -hmm. of the savant, more of a, like thinking process. There are kind of useless machines invented without any ambition to turn them into something actual. And just in between this instrument that takes both uh, sort of an aspect of a tool because it's directed towards a specific goal and kind of the, the inventive part of the machine. I mean, at least that's how I kind of see it um, or maybe not. And so I was just curious to know if like those terms were kind of battleground, battleground for uh, the artist uh, in the 18th century. So that's a dissertation. I'm sorry you already have your topic. Uh, that's, a, that's a PhD dissertation for sure. Uh, what I want to say quickly about that is, first of all, this is fascinating question. Thank you. I did not see that hierarchy of uh, terminology in the artist's writings. But that doesn't mean much in the sense that I wasn't looking for it. And so I may be wrong in my first approach. What I do know, and I open this up as a question for future research, is that the notion of machine machina is much more complex at the time that we may envision. I have a colleague who works on the Middle Ages who's done fantastic work on uh, machines in the Middle Ages, you know, it all starts with this idea, Greek idea, machina, as the device that we, was used in theater 
to bring into the scene the gods. That is the origin of the work. I was puzzled and that was a research project I had to put on the side when in researching for artisanal enlightenment, I came across the machine for teaching children the, um, the alphabet, reading, uh, reading and writing. Why was that called a machine? It is a cabinet, it's not a machine. It doesn't move at all. So um, it, it obviously, I, and I think at a certain point, I even went to the dictionaries uh, to look at the machine. And all I can remember about that is, that I, I mean, I was writing this book for my tenure, so I, I had to quickly decide whether to pursue or not. I didn't have an infinite amount of time. But what I remember, I do remember about this uh, sort of testing moment is that it was very interesting and surprising and, and so really worth another look and more attention. It just was too distant from what I wanted to do for artisanal enlightenment, but you know, it's a, dire it's a direction. And it's definitely a dissertation I would like to advertise or read. Great. And to advertise, I mean to advise or read. <laughs> Um, and perhaps a final question from Jim Bennett. I'm aware we're we're kind of at, at our edge of time, but it would be really great to hear from you, Jim. Thanks. Okay. Well, thanks for thanks for taking my question. I was intrigued, uh, Paula, by this idea, and thank you for a wonderful uh, a wonderful talk. But I was intrigued by the idea of the history of the mechanical arts having to uh, evince uh, linear progress. Um, so it's so it's experienced in history, but when you when you write the account, um, it has other it has to have other qualities than 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 truth to historical experience. And I wondered how how such a history would be critiqued. You know how what would you say if you didn't if you didn't accept the history that you were reading? Would you have a would you, would would you um have a, be able to have an, a, an alternative narrative that would challenge it? Well, no, clearly not, because that's not what the, what the history is for. And it struck me as, as interesting that if you take the, the other way that uh, the mechanical arts are, are experienced in, in, in the material world or in the world of our everyday experience, say the Huygens uh, cycloid, now the the, horo the the horological artist says, well, uh, the, as I understood from from what you've you've taught me, that um, the cycloid um, is all very well, but um, it's compromised in the clock. There's all these other parts. There's the the, the, the mechanical uh, interference of, of 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 everything that makes up a clock. It means I think you were saying that that the cycloid. Uh, isn't uh, experienced in the way that the savant uh, has shown us it, it should be. On the other hand, the wider account of the mechanical arts can't be challenged through experience. That somehow that linear progress is there for other reasons, and there are other arguments that uh, that that uh, 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 sh show it that dem demonstrate it, other than than the lived experience. So I was, I was, I was intrigued by that um, sort of inconstance, that uh, that mm -hmm. imbalance between how you appeal to experience. You can do it uh, in in the mechanical arts themselves, but it doesn't count when it comes to writing the history of the mechanical arts. Is that is that is that right? In part. So let me clarify what what I see uh, as the dynamic, the game uh, at play here. So linear progress doesn't mean that there is only one possible narrative of progress. So artists and savants would uh, challenge one another or each other about how that narrative should be, should be constructed. They might agree on process. So you need to build this linear progress. You can very well ignore the stagnation, and Diderot says it explicitly, the stagnation that occurred over uh, centuries, you just ignore that, you say the beginning, antiquity, 
usually Greece, and then you go to the next stage, which is now, for them now, and then the, the, the recent decades, with few exceptions. And, you know, the best example of that we have actually in the case of the history of electricity that Joseph Priestley produces. So that's granted, it's not technically a mechanical art, but it does have practical aspect that qualifies, uh, a qualify electricity also as a practical science at least. And so Joseph Priestley is adamant in the beginning of the uh, history and present state of electricity says, in writing this history, I have not taken into account the altercations, the quarrels among savants that led anywhere, that led nowhere. And so I've constructed this in a useful way for readers to understand how these science should be cultivated. And the notion that up until the 18th century, very little happened in electricity was uh, boasted by Priestley and others. You know, they, they, they boast of that. Uh, and some even say is a divine uh, revelation, is a second revelation. It's happening now because we are living in the enlightened age and, and, and this is what should happen. And so that's one, of course, I have found in my research on electricity, many others account, other accounts that disagree with that. Uh, but the notion of a linear progress is there, is the, is the idea that uh, cumulative knowledge exists, is a thing. And this is new if you think about uh, the, 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 the notion of lost knowledge that characterized the early modern period up to the quarrels of the ancients and the moderns. So this idea that the ancients knew much more than uh, in the present age and that these inventions got lost. They were obsessed by the loss of knowledge as best as went lost, uh, uh, went lost and um, uh, the, the red pigment, I don't remember the English, uh, went lost and all of these things. And so the idea it's difficult to construct a narrative of progress when there is a notion of knowledge that gets lost because it's not recorded. And that in part informed this idea of encyclopedias of the arts so that all that is known can be recorded in writing for posterity. At the same time, the, there is this interesting transition that happens uh, over the 17th century and well into the 18th century which brings the mod and I think the, the building of Versailles played a very important role as a, as, a, as a feast of incredible engineering, defying, you know, changing this swamp into a royal residence and a masterpiece of hydraulics. And so what they are seeing is that the moderns are actually um, uh, able to realize in practice, in reality, things that the ancients only dreamt about. For example, the moving trees that they see they have uh, made, in fact, uh, at Versailles. So with that debate, the quarrels of the ancients and the moderns that I think has not been properly framed around the mechanical arts, whereas it, it had a lot to do with mechanical arts because the mechanical arts gave yeah. the authors, the participants in this quarrel, the, the, the tools, the weapons to articulate this notion of modernity as something that drastically changed uh, the brock with the past. And this break had to do with this notion of the possibility in the future, the possibilities that open up for mankind in, in, in the future. And these possibilities are linked to the world of the mechanical arts, what we would call technologies. And it, over the 19th century, you know, it, 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 so the question of aesthetics is an interesting one, how, how pleasure and um, agreeable knowledge changes as these new notions enter the discourse on, on progress. So uh, this is how I read that. So yes, there are challenges to narratives, but they all partake. And then that culminates in the 19th century with positivism. But I think we have that root 
in, in, in the 18th century. And it's a route that really takes, uh, takes on, you know, it's not something that goes away. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, but I Carla. wish to write on this. You know, this is something that actually, um, yeah. I, I we, you know, I hope with time I will collect enough examples yeah. to say something about the emergence of the history of science and technology yeah. as this discourse that um, that circulates in the public arena, this idea of progress as tied to science and to the sciences and the oh. art. But it is a work in progress. I mean, there is a lot to be said there. And yeah, so. Um, thank you, thank you so much, Paula. Thank you for your incredibly thoughtful and rich and elegantly woven together responses to the kind of hail of questions that we've fired at you um, this evening or this afternoon for you. Um, we we could continue this conversation all evening. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're glad we won't, but we, we really hope and look forward to prolonging it at another date, maybe even in person um, in the future. So please do please do continue um, to join us for, for events. And yeah, thank you to all of the discussants. I know you probably had five more questions each that you would have liked to ask Paula. So thank you so much for your thoughtfulness and your reading. And again, we look forward to, to continuing and, and to all the attendees as well. Um, it's been great to see your names on the screen and some of your faces too. Thanks so much for listening and for your enthusiastic comments uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, as I said earlier, if anyone would like to sign up, um, to hear about future events, um, you can you can find us on on the Torch website at the Writing Technologies Network. Um, and the next event will be a workshop on Tuesday, the eighth of June, a lunchtime workshop from twelve thirty till two pm at BST, where we'll be hearing from Marie and from Houston Yu, a historian and art historian in the Faculty of Oriental Studies at Oxford. Um, and they'll be talking between them about compartments in both literary objects and literal objects. So we're going to have drawers and chapters and all kinds of different compartments. So we can't wait to see you then. And yeah, please do, please do join us if you can and at future events too. Thank, to you. Say thank you all for, for hosting, for having me and for your questions. Thank you so much. I'm available via email, so please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you. <laughs> bye, bye, bye.